Hello and welcome to another lecture for my class, PSYC 440-640, the class that's called Experimental Methods, but is really more a class on univariate data analytic techniques from a model comparisons perspective. Uh, this is the first lecture in the last unit of my class, the unit which covers factorial designs. Now, in a way, it's unfortunate because this is the unit which I think has some of the most interesting stuff and some of the stuff that's probably the most directly applicable to the types of research that many of the students in my classes do. That is, designs where there are more than one predictor variable uh, and those predictor variables are categorical in nature. So we're talking about factorial ANOVAs of various sorts. Now clearly there are all sorts of other types of designs, but this is what my students tend to do a lot. And um, I wish that this unit was longer so we could cover even more uh, detail about this topic, but because of the way the semester is set up, we're almost out of time at this point. That said, all the material that we've learned up to this point, especially a lot of the stuff in Unit 2 on multiple regression, is very applicable here. So hopefully um, this unit will give you, if you're a student in my class or if you're just someone watching on YouTube, a taste of how factorial designs work and enough information to do your own exploration of this topic. Uh, by the way, I should add that I will um, continue to make supplemental videos for this lecture series that will include topics or further exploration of topics that we cover in Unit 4. So stay tuned for that. There'll be more stuff on Factorial ANOVA coming very soon. Before we get there, let's just do the introduction. As I said, this is uh, the first lecture of the last unit of my class, the unit on factorial design. So appropriately enough, this lecture is an introduction to factorial designs. And I'll begin by basically talking about different types of uh, factorial designs and some of the naming conventions that apply to them. And then I'll talk about the relationship between factorial designs and regression. And as you've heard me say a lot of times in the last unit of this class, ANOVA is just a special case of regression, or, or ANOVA can be thought of as a special case of regression, one in which we have categorical predictor variables. Now that still holds in this unit. The additional challenges and kind of interesting uh, features of this unit come from the fact that there are just different ways we can code for those categorical predictor uh, levels of those categorical predictors. And that gives us some, some challenges and some opportunities when setting up our analyses. So anyway, factorial designs. Um, I'm beginning with a picture of a kind of a, uh, a field, not unlike some of the fields that you would find out in North Dakota, uh, although I suppose this one's a bit hillier than what I see around campus here. Um, and this is appropriate because as you'll see in a couple more slides, a lot of the um, kind of foundation for uh, ANOVA and for factorial designs was uh, developed by R.A. Fisher during a time in his life when he was conducting research and uh, developing data analytic techniques at an agricultural research uh, station in England back in the 20s. So I'm always kind of reminded of agriculture when I think of factorial designs. And by the way, what are factorial designs? Well, you've already done ANOVA or we've already covered ANOVA. ANOVA is um, our, dis our um, it's a way of doing a data analysis where we have one categorical predictor variable and one continuous outcome variable. Factorial ANOVA are just ANOVA where there are more than one categorical predictor variable. There's still only one continuous outcome variable. There's not more than that. If we had more than one outcome variable, we would be doing a multiple analysis of variance or a MANOVA, which is a multivariate technique, which I don't really get to in this class. Although I cover it a little bit when I talk about dependent designs and maybe I'll try and cover it more in the supplemental lecture at some point. Uh, and what's interesting um, about factorial designs, like with uh, multiple regression, is that when you have more than one predictor variable, you can look at interactions between those predictor variables. And there are all sorts of reasons why you might want to do that. By the way, uh, the word factor is just another name for the independent or predictor variables. So I think sometimes it's confusing for people. Uh, they hear independent variable in one class and predictor variable in another and factor in yet another class. And it's easy to miss the fact that those are all referring to the same thing. That is predictor variables, especially categorical predictor variables, especially categorical predictor variables approached from kind of an ANOVA perspective. 
So I mentioned R.A. Fisher just a, a couple slides back. Uh, he is a, a sort of a towering figure in the history of applied statistics. He's the guy who developed or refined many of the statistical and data analytic techniques that we've covered in this class and many, many more that we did not. Um, I mention him now because uh, during a period in his life when he was sort of uh, off in the countryside, literally in England, uh, working at an agricultural research center, because he couldn't get a job anywhere else, because he was such a know-it-all and a prickly personality, um, he developed some really interesting techniques, which are now ANOVA. And he published these in some of the first uh, statistics textbooks that we have. You know, a, a lot of statistics, uh, mathematical statistics, uh, statistics is written up in rather rigorous mathematical language, in, in proofs and so on. Um, what R.A. Fisher did was he wrote um, uh, his studies of crop variation, and he wrote up uh, the techniques they'd used to compare different types of treatments for crops in a textbook that was really uh, aimed at people who knew math, but were not themselves mathematicians, and were instead kind of interested in uh, using math, using statistical techniques to test hypotheses. And this was, in, in many ways, the first statistics textbook of the sort that we're now, of course, very familiar with. And I mentioned that uh, this was all done in the context of agricultural research. It, it, it was. It was, uh, you know, people at the uh, Rothsam, Rothsam, uh, I think it is, uh, agricultural research uh, base in England were looking at uh, the effects of different types of fertilizer and the effects of different types of watering and irrigation on rows of crops. And uh, Fisher's, uh, among his many great insights, was to come up with ways that you could uh, isolate the effects of, say, uh, a particular fertilizer versus not getting the fertilizer as compared to the effect of a particular irrigation system versus not getting the irrigation system. And uh, to this day, a lot of times when people are working in the world of factorial ANOVA, they'll arrange their data a bit like this. You can see here we have um, columns for the different factors. You know, in this case, this is a data set from our textbook, Andy Fields uh, Discovering Statistics Using SPSS, where there are two factors or predictor variables. There's uh, people in the study either get no alcohol, they get two pints of beer or four pints of beer, and then the people who get these drinks are either female or male. Those are our two predictor variables. We have some outcome variables, which are ratings of attractiveness of potential targets, like uh, you know sexual attractiveness, I think it is. And the data, which are all the numbers here, are arranged in a way that always reminds me, and I think many people, a little bit of like rows of crops in a field, some of which are given a certain type of fertilizer, some of which are given a certain type of irrigation, and so on. And of course, there's this real historical reason why that, why that happens, or why we often arrange data this way. Anyway, I mentioned before that in the world of factorial ANOVA, we're often kind of interested in interactions, and we know about interactions back from unit two. Interactions are just situations in, when, in which the effect of one predictor variable varies or changes across levels of another predictor variable. Um, we study interactions a lot in psychology because most of the things we care about, most of the outcome variables, are things which uh, are multiply determined. You know, there's probably very few examples of strong one-to-one -one relationships in psychology and the related behavioral sciences. Instead, we have um, outcome variables which are uh, which change or which occur because of the contributions of multiple variables which may themselves influence uh, one another. Now, having interactions in our designs uh, makes it a little bit difficult to uh, interpret main effects of predictor variables, and I, I think I made this point back in Unit 2 when I talked about regression. I'm repeating it here because it's just surprising to me to see, even as recently as maybe about a week ago, I was reading through comments on a Facebook um, group that I'm a member of that talks about research methods and statistics, and I, I saw a little sort of Facebook argument between people, uh, one of whom uh, was holding that you could interpret main effects when there are interactions in your model, another which was insisting that you could not. I tend to fall into that uh, along with that latter argument. I think that when there are interactions in your model, it becomes difficult or sometimes even impossible to interpret main effects. It has a lot to do really with the nature 
and almost like you could say the shape of the interaction. And thus, when there are interactions present, uh, we have to do a fair bit of work to characterize what they are, or what they, how they work. Uh, things like graphing, things like doing follow-up tests. And that's actually a lot of what I'm going to talk about in the lectures that make up this unit. Just the ways that we can follow up interactions when we find them in factorial ANOVA. Uh, much like we had to talk about how do you follow up interactions when they occur in multiple regression, way back in unit two. And as a bit of a preview, fundamentally the approaches are the same. They involve things like graphing and follow-up tests and so on. Just a quick example of what I'm talking about if you're having a hard time kind of picturing it. Here is an image, I don't know where I got this, I think from Google, or, or I'm sorry, from Wikipedia. It's um, looking at a situation in which we have uh, the effects of exercise on sleep quality. I mean, there is a real literature on, the, on these relationships out there, I'm sure. And uh, here we're imagining that exercise could occur either in the morning or in the evening. Uh, exercise could be either light intensity or heavy intensity. So we have two predictor variables, each of which have two levels. We're doing a factorial ANOVA. Our one outcome variable is sleep quality. And you can see on the right here, different uh, possible uh, outcomes of our analysis. We might find that there's no effect of either variable. We might find that there's a significant effect of one but not the other or vice versa, or as you can see in the bottom two panels of the image, we could find some sort of interaction. And in the case of some interactions that are sort of modest spreading interactions, this is they're sometimes called, you can see an example of that in the bottom right, it's kind of possible to talk about the main effect of the variable. So you could maybe talk about like the main effect of time of day, even though there's an interaction between time of day and uh, and level of intensity on the outcome variable. You know, if you look at that bottom right image, it sort of looks like uh, there's no effect of uh, intensity of exercise on sleep outcome unless that in the exercise is being done in the evening, in which case heavy exercise in the evening is uh, affected is associated with greater sleep quality than light uh, exercise in the evening. Um, you could kind of talk about a main effect of uh, morning versus evening in that case. But in the uh, bottom left uh, image, you can see what's um, sometimes called a crossover interaction or like a full interaction, where the effect of one predictor variable or one factor depends a lot on the level of the other. You, know, you have kind of the opposite relationship between intensity of exercise and quality of sleep, depending on whether you're doing that exercise in the morning or the, in the evening. In that type of situation, if you were doing this analysis and that's what you found, it's becoming, it becomes almost meaningless to talk about, well, what's the main effect of time of day on exercise, on sleep quality, or what's the main effect of, of intensity of exercise on sleep quality, because it's so thoroughly dependent. Um, I shouldn't say dependent, it's so thoroughly contingent. You know, um, the type of effect you get for intensity depends a lot or is contingent a lot on the time of day in which you're exercising and vice versa. I know I kind of perseverate on this point, uh, well I have just now and I have in previous lectures, I just think it's really important and I, I've been over the years kind of frustrated mildly or, or more than mildly to hear students and colleagues, you know, talk about some rather elaborate analysis they've done, note passingly that there's some rather complicated interaction and then hold forth at great length of the main effect of this variable and the main effect of that variable and I think in most cases that type of analysis or that approach to analysis is at the very least misguided. Okay, well that's enough of me sermonizing about the importance of understanding interactions when doing um, analyses where there are more than one predictor variable, more than one factor. Uh, I'm going to move on now and talk about some more stuff that just generally has to do with factorial designs. I want to talk about the naming conventions or the nomenclature for these designs. Um, <clears throat> in this lecture and in the next one or, or two that follow, uh, I'm going to be focusing on independent factorial designs. These are designs that involve uh, situations where there are multiple predictor variables. Each predictor variable has multiple levels and those levels are made up of independent groups of people. So people uh, come into your laboratory or into your clinic, they are randomly assigned to different levels of one treatment, they're randomly assigned to different levels of another treatment. Uh, the people in those little groups don't overlap. You know, if you're in you know, one group, you're not also in another group. 
they are in that sense independent independent factorial designs that's as distinct from dependent factorial designs dependent factorial designs are ones in which there are multiple predictor variables or factors those predictor variables have levels but the levels are made up of some of the same people so we might bring people into the laboratory and they might go through uh, several sets of mood inductions, you know, positive mood induction, and then some period of time passes and negative mood induction, some period of time passes and, you know, like neutral mood induction happens. It's the same people going through different manipulations and being measured repeatedly. Um, because they're the same people, they are by definition dependent. It's not different independent people on those different levels of the predictor variable. Um, because of the way these types of uh, uh, designs are set up and run, um, they, often involve, they often involve measuring the same variable repeatedly. They're commonly called repeated measures designs or somewhat confusingly related designs. Uh, or within subjects designs. Um, we'll just use the more general term dependent factorial designs. So we have independent factorial designs, dependent factorial designs, and as you may know there are mixed factorial designs and these are well they can be complicated to actually uh, break down and analyze but at a basic level they're they're fairly simple they're just factorial designs which involve at least one independent factor and at least one dependent factor and uh, thus mixed and uh, again we call these factorial ANOVAs or factorial designs because uh, they just have more than one predictor variable or more than one factor. And as I've said a few different times already, ANOVA, whether you know one-way ANOVA or factorial ANOVA, they're just, um, or can, these are analyses that can be thought of as um, extensions of the general linear model or just another, uh, another way to do a regression. And I'll talk about some of the, the different approaches we can take to factorial ANOVA, seeing it as a more kind of classic ANOVA design, seeing it as more of a uh, regression design. Well, hopefully this is all making sense so far. Uh, if it's not, uh, pause, slow down, rewatch, or leave a comment for me in the YouTube comment area. A um, couple more points to make before moving on. There are two general naming conventions for factorial ANOVA, and they're not, um, they're slightly similar and they're slightly different. Sometimes people get them a little confused. Um, one naming convention names an ANOVA in terms of the number of predictor variables and the type of design that the uh, ANOVA has. So I might say I have a three-way independent ANOVA. That means I'm doing an independent ANOVA and I've got three independent factors. So these are three factors made up of levels and those levels are non-overlapping or the, the people who make up those levels are non-overlapping with each other. So three-way independent ANOVA tells the reader or tells the person hearing it that there are three predictor variables and that those variables are independent. There's a slightly different naming convention that you sometimes hear that's predictor level by um, predictor level by predictor level type design. So someone might say, I have a two by three independent ANOVA. This tells the reader, or tells the, the person who hears it, that there are two predictor variables, two factors. One has two levels, the other has three levels. So you can see these, these two naming conventions are not exactly the same, and it may be a little bit easy to confuse the one for the other. I prefer the second approach that's on offer here, the, uh, the number of levels for the first predictor by the number of levels for the second predictor, and then you name the type of ANOVA. So two by three, because of course that gives a lot more information. It tells the person that I have two factors. I'm saying that they're independent, so this is not a repeated measures or within subjects design. And I'm even telling the person who's uh, who's reading or who's listening to me talk that there are uh, two levels in that first predictor variable, two, three levels in the second. So there there's kind of six cells or six groups in total in my design. And that's, you know, that's hopefully interesting information to them. So anyway, now that we've thought a little bit about sort of the general terms and the naming conventions and so on, let's move on to breaking down factorial designs, talking about kind of how they work. And the important point to note right now is that factorial ANOVA works basically like regular ANOVA in that we have a total amount of variability that we break down into a portion that we can explain 
by using our model, which is made up of our predictor variables, and then a portion that we can't explain. The, uh, the innovation or, or the difference is that we can then take that explained portion and break it down into the parts that are associated with our various predictor variables or our various factors. Here you can see A and B, like you know, predictor variable A, predictor variable B, and of course their interaction. So uh, that's what's different or what's new when we have more than one predictor variable and we allow those to interact. And um, we'll be spending time talking about how this works and how we can talk about the independent contributions of our predictor variables. Um, by the way, here, uh, this is an image from Andy Field's textbook, and as you can see, he's using the kind of the subscripting notation approach for these different sums of squares. Um, you know, we can also call this sums of squares model the sum of squares error reduced because it's the uh, reduction of error or improvement in model when we compare a compact model which has no predictor variables to the augmented model which has all of the predictor variables. And as I've noted in previous lectures a ways back, it can get a little confusing if we have, uh, you know, the non-subscripted and the subscripted notation for our different sums of squares. So I, I try and be consistent. And by the time we get to factorial ANOVA, it's often just easier to use subscripting notation. So I think that's why I do in this lecture, and I know in some of the other lectures for this unit, that's that's kind of my focus. So let's imagine an example here. Imagine you're a social psychologist, you're studying uh, the effects of alcohol, and you have two predictor variables or factors. You have gender, uh, which has two levels. You know, uh, our participants are either male or female. Of course, if we were doing this for real, we might include a third category for folks who identify as transgender, but um, this is uh, fake data um, and it's meant to be sort of simple. So we just have two levels of our uh, factor for gender and we have two levels of our factor for alcohol dose. There's zero pints of alcohol and four pints of alcohol. And then because we're doing a factorial ANOVA, we almost always create an interaction for those two predictor variables or two factors. Uh, our outcome variable is ratings of attractiveness of targets. Like we imagine people come into the laboratory, we don't assign them to levels of gender, they are naturally the gender that they identify as, but we do, let's say, randomly assign them to get either zero or four pints of beer, and then we sit people down in front of computers and we have them rate different faces as to how sexually attractive they are. Um, this is uh, based on, or I'll be using a data set from Andy Field's text book, which you can get uh, online for free, I think. Um, I'll show you the data in just a, a slide later. I should say there is actually a real literature out there. I remember in grad school being sort of interested in studying this for my dissertation, the kind of beer goggles effect. You know, is it the case that when you drink a lot, you know, you become more sexually attracted to other people or you rate people who are otherwise you would not find attractive as more attractive. Um, it's been a long time since I've looked at that literature, but it really exists. And although I didn't contribute to it with my dissertation, which was eventually a different topic, it's always kind of funny to me at this portion of the semester to see this fake data set because it reminds me of a research interest that I had way back when. Anyway, if, if you don't have access to Andy Field's website uh, from the publisher, um, here's the data. You can see here uh, we've got 32 different people, uh, half of whom are male, half of whom are female, half of whom get no alcohol, half of whom get four pints of beer, and then attractiveness is a continuous variable. And, and I have no idea what this variable really is or what its range really is. It's, again, this is fake data, but um, suffice it to say that's our, that's our outcome variable there. Now, if we're going to uh, analyze this data, there are a number of different approaches we can take. Just to be kind of quick about it, though, and get jump right in, let's open up SPSS and go to Analyze General Linear Model Univariate. Uh, univariate, because there's only one outcome variable. Uh, we're going to put that outcome variable, attractiveness, in the dependent variable box. So dependent variable, outcome variable, same thing. And we're going to put our two predictor variables, gender and alcohol consumption, into the fixed factor boxes. And I'll talk in a separate supplemental lecture about the distinction between a fixed factor and a random factor. But suffice it to say, for most of our work in this unit, we're going to be using fixed factors. So just bang those into the fixed factor box. There are all sorts of options and, and um, graphs and contrasts and whatnot that you can dial in, but for the time being, we're just going to skip all of that. 
Um, actually, I shouldn't say we're not going to skip all of that. Uh, I don't have this shown on the computer screen, but if you click on options, you can also click on uh, include parameter estimates. It's a little checkbox. I'll talk about what it means later, but you could do that right now if you wanted to. Then go ahead and hit OK. You'll get some output. Output looks a little bit like this. There is the standard uh, GLM, General Linear Model Output, where we can see the, the corrected model, the intercept, our factors, their interaction, error term, total, and corrected total. There's some, that's complicated looking, but I will explain what all those uh, terms mean. And if you asked for it, you can get those weird looking parameter estimates. Um, I'll talk about these a little bit more later on, what those actually mean. Your gender equals zero, gender equals one, and so on. Suffice it to say, though, for the time being, you can notice in the top table, the test of between subject effects, there appears to be a significant effect for gender, there appears to be a significant effect for alcohol, and there appears to be a significant interaction of these two predictor variables. So we're probably going to want to focus our attention on understanding the nature of that interaction. Now we'll get to all of the, the details a little bit later, but for right now I want to kind of shift gears slightly and address the idea of factorial ANOVA as regression. I've already said a bunch of times that, that uh, you know, ANOVA really is regression or ANOVA can be thought of as regression or you can do a, treat a factorial ANOVA from like a regression perspective. You, you've heard me say that, let's actually do it. So here, what we've got are same predictor variables. We've got gender, two levels, alcohol, two levels. And to be clear, we, this would work even if we had more than two levels of our predictor variable. So if you know, alcohol was like zero or no alcohol, two points of alcohol, four points of alcohol, uh, things get a little bit more complicated. I'm deliberately keeping it simple by doing two levels of gender and two levels of alcohol. In a separate supplemental lecture, I'll give some examples of more complicated analyses. But for the time being, it's easiest just to think of it this way. Recall that our general linear model looks a little bit like this. We have our predicted value, uh, uh, value for the outcome variable equals b sub 0, that's our intercept, plus b sub 1 times x sub 1, that's our first predictor variable. Maybe it's going to be you know, gender, plus b sub 2 times x sub 2, that's our second predictor variable that's going to be maybe you know, alcohol dose. Then b sub 3 times x sub 1 plus x sub 2, that's our interaction term for the interaction of gender and alcohol, and it's going to have a regression coefficient associated with it. Now, at this point, the only thing really kind of tricky, or it's not even really new because we covered this a little bit in the last unit, in unit three, is we have to represent the levels of our categorical predictor variable, our factors. We have to represent them using coding variables. We can't just bang them into our uh, regression. Um, now the levels of our, or the number of uh, coding variables is going to be equal to 1 minus the number of levels of each of our categorical predictors. But in this case, because I was a bit lazy and I deliberately um, uh, set up a situation in which each predictor variable, each factor only has two levels, this is going to be kind of easy because we need one coding variable for gender, so two levels of gender, so 2 minus 1 is 1, and we need one predictor variable for uh, alcohol dose because, again, there are two levels there, so 2 minus 1 is, is 1, so pretty simple. So we're going to use dummy coding first, and we're going to use dummy coding where uh, male is given the value of 0 for our first uh, code variable, x sub 1, uh, female is given one. That's obviously kind of arbitrary. It could easily be the other way around. Um, we're going to use dummy coding for our second predictor variable, x sub 2, which is alcohol. Here we're going to give uh, zero to the people who get no uh, amount of alcohol. That kind of makes sense because that's an appropriate kind of baseline or comparison group. And one to the people who get four pints of beer to drink. Now that's, again, pretty similar to what we uh, encountered back in unit number three. Um, we just use categorical, uh, I'm sorry, we use code variables, in this case dummy code variables and values, 
to code for the levels of our predictor variable. What's a little bit new, or is kind of like a callback to unit two, our multiple regression unit, is we then create an interaction term by multiplying the values of those two code variables. And in this case, since the values are only ever zeros and ones, the multiplication is really easy. And you can see it done there. That column for interaction is literally just the product of the values for the two code variables. So 0 times 0 is 0, 0 times 1 is 0, and so on and so on. So interaction is just the product of those dummy code. Here's a screenshot from my Excel file just to show you how this might look if you set it up in a data frame, either in Excel or in SPSS. Pretty straightforward, I think. All I've done is add those code or dummy coded variables and the values for the interaction term. And you can't see it, but I've done the same thing in an SPSS file. Now that I've got my SPSS file, uh, what I'm going to do is go to analyze regression linear. My dependent variable or outcome variable is again attractiveness. And I'm just going to put my uh, code variables for alcohol. I'm sorry, for gender, for alcohol, and the interaction all in the model in one step, in block one of one. Now back in unit two, when we talked about multiple regression, I uh, often took the approach of entering, you know, the so-called main effects, you know, the, the two predictor variables in this case in one block and then the interaction term in the second block because it allowed for a, a test to see whether including the interaction significantly improves the fit of the model. I could have done that here, but just to be quick and a bit lazy about it, I banged everything in at exactly the same step. Yeah, so you can do that too if you want. Once you hit OK, you'll get some familiar, I hope, regression output that looks a little bit like this. And right away, you can see that uh, the model, that is the augmented model that includes the predictor variables and their interaction, is statistically significant. So at a really sort of um, overall or omnibus level, yes, you can treat a factorial ANOVA as a regression if you want to, and it works pretty well. We can see that uh, our predictor variables um, explain uh, you know, approximately... 82% or maybe more like, um, I'm sorry, 68% or maybe more like, you know, 65% of the variance in the outcome variable. Um, one thing that you may notice if you're very keen eyed is that the value for gender here looks a little different than it did in the output for our GLM analysis. And specifically uh, in the GLM analysis, it looked like the effect of gender was significant. And here it looks like it's not significant. And that may be a bit confusing. So again, here's our GLM output, and it sort of looks like here that gender is a significant, the, the effect of gender is significant. In the regression output, it kind of looks like it isn't. Also, there are these coefficients that look kind of the same and kind of different. So we have an intercept in our GLM output, a constant in our regression output, those aren't the same. We've got uh, some values in terms of our unstandardized regression coefficients, which we can see in the output for our parameter estimates in the GLM output, but some which look a little bit different, and there are all these weird kind of blank spots in the GLM output. Uh, what's all this mean? You know, what's going on here, you might be wondering. Well, this may seem like a little bit of a, dig of a digression, but bear with me because I think this is interesting and I think it's important. This is how we coded the levels of our predictor variable when we ran the analysis in regression. We did dummy coding and we used values that look like this, zero for male, one for female, that of course was kind of an arbitrary decision, zero for no alcohol, one for four pints of beer. That's somewhat arbitrary, but it makes sense to put zero for the no alcohol group because they're, they then become the baseline. This is how SPSS coded the levels in GLM. That is, when we ran the GLM analysis, even though we ourselves didn't make any specific decisions about how to code the levels, you know, like females who drink four pints of alcohol, males who drink no pints of alcohol, GLM kind of behind the scenes is doing just that. It, however, codes in a slightly different way. Um, it codes where it gives the first level of any predictor variable the value of one and then zero to the subsequent level. And um, so the reason why the regression coefficients in our regression output and the parameter estimate 
uh, uh, coefficients in our GLM output look different is because they're coding different contrasts. And that's strictly because of just the way the math works out as a consequence of these two different coding systems. Now, if you're patient and you bear with me, we can go ahead and plug in the different dummy code values and solve for our coefficients, b sub 0, b sub 1, b sub 2, and b sub 3. And that's actually, I think, a nice exercise, both because it gives us some inf interesting information and because it kind of highlights how these two approaches to coding are somewhat different. So let's go ahead and begin with how we coded for regression. Again, you can see up at the top of the screen, this is the coding scheme that we used, or I guess I should say that I used when I sat down to run this analysis as a regression. So let's begin by trying to solve for B sub zero, our intercept or our constant in our, in, in our um, regression equation. Well, the easiest way to do that is to pick the value, or I'm sorry, pick the group that gets the 0, 0 code. Pick the group that is coded 0 for our first predictor variable, x sub 1, and 0 for our second predictor variable, x sub 2. That group happens to be, in this coding scheme, the male no alcohol group. So we can get our regression equation, write it out like that. We can substitute in zeros for x sub 1, x sub 2, and of course 0 times 0 is 0. That gets uh, rid of the terms b sub 1, x sub 1, b sub 2, x sub 2, and b sub 3, x sub 1, x sub 2. Those all go to 0 because we're multiplying by 0, and that leaves us with just b sub 0, which is what we're trying to solve for. Now we know in the world of ANOVA that the best prediction for a member of a group is the mean for that group. So in this case, we're saying the predicted value for the outcome variable, you know, y hat. y hat is going to be equal to the mean for the group, male, no alcohol, the group that got the zero, zero codes, just like we see here. So I'm just going to substitute in the mean for that value, which happens to be 66.88. So right there, boom, we've solved for b sub zero. b sub zero, the intercept for the model, the intercept for the equation is the mean for the male no alcohol group. So here, if we just go ahead and look at the regression output, you can see that 66.88 is the value for the constant in our regression output. And if you don't believe me, uh, you could double check by getting some descriptive statistics, any of a number of different ways in SPSS, and see that yes, people who are in the male no alcohol group, the mean level for the outcome variable for them is 66.88. So it's, you know, it's the same, allowing for rounding in the third decimal place. Really quickly, this is how SPSS did the coding. Again, it's the same idea, it's dummy coding. It's just dummy coding where the order of numbers for the different levels happens to be reversed. And why that is, I, I don't exactly know. That's just how SPSS goes. Now, the same idea uh, applies though. We want to solve for B sub zero. In this case, um, that means we want to get the uh, pick the group that has the zero zero code. In this case, that group happens to be the female four pints of beer group. So same thing, we substitute in the zeros. That gets rid of a bunch of terms, leaves us with just B sub zero. So in the way the SPSS did its coding, the intercept is the mean for the female four pints of beer group. And if you wanna just quickly double check that, you can see that in the GLM output, the intercept is 55, I'm sorry, 57.5. And if you don't believe me, you can check some descriptive statistics and see, aha, in the GLM output, which of course uses SPSS's coding, it does it automatically for us, kind of behind the scenes, uh, the intercept or the constant for a regression equation is 57.5. So it's the mean for the female four pints of alcohol group, four, four pints of beer. So important point here, two different coding systems, they're, they're both dummy coding, but the values for those levels are assigned differently. Two different coding systems, two different solutions. For our dummy coding system, B sub zero, the intercept for the equation, is the mean for the male no alcohol group. For SBSS's dummy coding system, B sub zero, the intercept, is the mean for the female four points of beer group. Let's keep 
pushing forward and kind of playing around with subbing in different values. This is how we coded the regression equation, or I'm sorry, this is how we coded the group's regression. So just see at the top there, we're back to our coding scheme. Let's keep on solving. Let's solve for B sub one. So we're gonna pick the group that has one for X sub one, our first predictor variable, and zero for X sub two, our second predictor variable. The reason we're doing this is it allows us to get rid of the B sub two term and the B sub three term because they get multiplied by zero. So if we, uh, you know, that simplifies the equation a little, a little bit. And the predicted value, of course, is going to be the mean for that group, the female zero pints of alcohol group. So we already know, of course, what B sub zero is. It's the mean for the male no pints of alcohol group. So just by simple subtraction, of course, B sub one is the difference or the contrast between males and females who drink no alcohol. So it's like saying B sub one is the effect of, um, of gender for people who don't drink alcohol, which happens to be negative 6.26. If you want to check that, you can look at the regression output and what the regression, what appears in the table for coefficients in the regression output, uh, with the term gender, because that's the variable, the name of the variable. You know, if, if we called it dummy one, it would have been dummy one. The way I labeled it, it's called gender, negative 6.25. That's equal to the difference between the mean for the male no alcohol group and the female no alcohol group. You can see I did the simple subtraction right there. So in this case, gender in our output for our coefficients from our regression analysis isn't really like the main effect for gender it's just the effect uh, which would be the effect of gender across both levels of the beverage rather it's a contrast it's a comparison uh, between uh, genders for one level of the beverage that is men versus women or men compared to women among people who are not drinking any alcohol so if we take a look now at how SPSS codes the levels of the dummy coded variables for its analysis in the GLM module, we can again try and solve for B sub one, this time plugging in the value for the uh, mean of the male four points of alcohol group. That's gonna allow us to solve for B sub one. And we can see here that B sub one is just the contrast or the difference between males and females who drink four pints of alcohol. So we take a look at the GLM output here. You can see what the GLM um, output in parameter estimates calls gender equals zero, which is kind of confusing, is negative 21.8786. That is the difference between the means for the male four pints of alcohol group and the female four pints of alcohol group. So if we look at the output, the parameter estimates table in our GLM output, we can see gender equals zero, negative 21.88 or so. Um, that's not like the main effect for gender. Instead, it's just, again, a contrast. In this case, it's the contrast between men and women at the four pints of, of beer level of alcohol dose. So the important point again is that we've got two different coding systems, so we get two different solutions, this time for, for B sub one. They just mean different things as a consequence of the way the math works out. In our demi coding system, B sub one was the difference between uh, females uh, who drink no alcohol and males who drink no alcohol. In SPSS's coding system, B sub one is the difference between males who drink four pints of beer and females who drink four pints of beer. And to be clear, it's not like one way is the right way and the other way is the wrong way. They're just you know, different approaches that yield slightly different results. Moving on, let's go back to how we coded the levels of the dummy coding variable for regression. And we'll keep on solving. Uh, we want to know what B sub two is. We need to pick the group that's going to have a value for one for the variable X sub two. And once we do that, because of the way that the zeros all uh, are figured in and multiplied out, we can solve for B sub two is just going to equal um, the mean for the male 
Uh, four pints of beer group minus B sub zero. That's a value we already know. So B sub two in our coding system is just going to be the difference between men who drink four pints of beer and men who drink zero pints of beer. So again, it's a difference. It's a contrast or a comparison for men. Now finally, let's try and solve for B sub 3 using our coding system. Now, in order to do that, we're going to pick the group that has values of 1 for both x sub 1 and x sub 2. That's going to allow us to keep the regression coefficient B sub 3 uh, in the equation. And because we, at this point in our work, already know what B sub 0 and B sub 1 and B sub 2 are, we can actually solve for B sub 3 without an, uh, too much trouble. What we have to do is just substitute in those values that we already know uh, for B sub 0, B sub 1, and B sub 2. Now we can get rid of uh, the parentheses. We don't really have to, but it's, it's easier to get rid of the parentheses. And then you can just see the values that subtract away to nothing. So the mean for men in the zero pints of alcohol group, you know, minus the mean for the men in zero pints of alcohol group is obviously zero. So we can just kind of cross those out. That leaves us with this, uh, this equation here. And now what we want to do is just arrange our terms into pairs and pairs that reflect differences. So what I've done here is I've moved uh, the uh, average for females in the zero pints of alcohol group across the equal sign. And so it's kind of paired off with the mean for females at the four pints of alcohol group. And likewise, on the other side of the equation, I've got males at four pints of alcohol minus males at zero points of alcohol. I'm creating these little pairs. I'm just throwing those parentheses back around them to kind of emphasize that they're little pairs of that reflect differences. And then I'm just going to move them across the equal sign. So I end up with B sub 3 as a difference of differences. It's the difference between the difference of alcohol for women and the difference for the effect of alcohol for men. Um, and as I've said in past lectures, and as I'll say at least a few times in this lecture, this is one way to think about interactions, especially in a kind of a factorial ANOVA context, as differences between differences. By the way, we can also solve it the other way. So we can just take our same solution and rearrange it slightly differently. So that B sub 3 is the difference of gender, men versus women, for 4 pints of alcohol minus the difference of gender, men versus women, for 0 pints of, of alcohol. That's, you know, just algebraically the same. But the key idea here is that once again, we're doing differences of differences. So whether we think about B sub 3 as kind of the effect of alcohol among women minus the effect of alcohol among men, or is the effect of gender at the four points of alcohol level minus the effect of gender at the zero points of alcohol level, same thing, same idea, and crucially, this differences of differences way of thinking about uh, interactions. So the important point, uh, in fact, Royal Inova, interactions can be thought of as differences between differences. I've said that now a bunch of times. Another important point is that um, knowing how you or SPSS has coded the levels of categorical predictor variables can be really useful because it allows you to solve for those regression coefficients, those parameter estimates, in ways that can be interpretable. You get that output from GLM, those parameter estimates, and instead of just ignoring them and thinking, oh God, what does that mean? You can look at them and say, aha, I know that these reflect means and differences between means and in the case of the interaction term, whatever the regression coefficient is for your interaction term, it's the difference between differences. And that can be really useful to know. Another important point is that uh, factorial ANOVA using the GLM module is pretty easy. I mean, it doesn't require that we do any work coding levels of a predictor variable. It's relatively easy for us to run an omnibus test, that is, to kind of see whether the overall model or any of the uh, 
factors in the model or indeed their interaction are significantly associated with the outcome variable. Um, however, it's often a little trickier to get uh, contrasts and comparisons between different levels of those predictor variables. Um, if, we're, if we're mindful and careful about it, we can uh, get some of that information from parameter estimates, but often this can be a little bit tricky. In contrast, if we do our factorial ANOVA in the regression module, it's a little bit trickier at first to set up our main analyses um, because we have to code the levels of our categorical predictor variables. But if we're mindful or sort of thoughtful about how we do that, we can get regression coefficients which give us information about comparisons that we care about. So uh, it's not that one way is right and the other way is wrong. These are two different ways to approach uh, your analysis, at least in SPSS. You can use the GLM module or the regression module. I tend to prefer the regression module just because I like having that level of control over the comparisons that I think are interesting. Although it does, of course, take a bit more work. Again, I've said this now a few different times, a few different ways, but it bears repeating. Uh, there are different ways to think about regression coefficients. We can think about them as differences between means or groups of uh, for groups or differences between differences. And we can think about them as lines in a regression equation. We think about them as regression coefficients. We can see them as differences between differences. I've said that now a bunch of different times. So again, in our recent example here, uh, regression coefficient B sub three describes the difference or, or, or the, the, the change between the effect of alcohol among men and women, um, I'm sorry, the effect of gender uh, at the no alcohol level versus the effect of gender at the four pints of beer level. So again, in uh, factorial ANOVA, we can think about interactions um, as differences between differences. So we've got the difference between men and women at the no alcohol level and difference between men and women at the four pints of beer level. There's those differences are not the same. That's the nature of the interaction. We can also think of differences, uh, I'm sorry, of interactions as the differences in the slopes that describe the contrasts between levels of a factor. So here uh, you can literally think of the slope um, of the line that describes the relationship between men and women who drink no alcohol and the slope for the line of men and women that, who drink four points of alcohol and clearly those slopes are different or there's kind of like a change in slope as you move from no alcohol consumption to four pints of beer consumption. It's just a different way to basically think of the same thing that is an interaction in factorial ANOVA. Okay, just to wrap up uh, this little introductory lecture, let's just consider a few more things that can be a little bit confusing about the way uh, SPSS's GLM module um, organizes its output. So here's a table uh, that you always get from GLM, uh, in, which is the test of between subject effects. And the output, let's be honest, can be a little bit confusing. There are some terms here that are, of course, obvious or familiar. There's some other stuff that isn't quite so familiar. One thing is the intercept here. Um, the intercept and the significance test for the intercept is just the sum of squares around the grand mean. So you can think about that test, you know, that F statistic for the intercept as being a comparison between the compact model, which is just the sample mean, and some sort of really compact model, which is just zero. Um, the effect is almost always pretty large and statistically significant, but almost never very interesting. But it, we get that analysis in our GLM output. So again, the intercept, this line here, what's this big sum of squares and what's this huge F statistic, 1,303 mean? Well, it's just like you're doing a comparison, except this time uh, you don't have a compact model and an augmented model. You've got an, a compact model and like a really compact model. And like I said, the difference is almost always statistically significant, but almost never uh, all that interesting. At the bottom of the table here, you have total, and this is just the sum of squares for that really compact model, the, comp the amount of um, unexplained variability in a model that has zero as the prediction for all the values. 
The corrected model up here is the augmented model that we're familiar with, tested against the usual compact model, that is the grand mean. Um, it's corrected in the sense that we're comparing it against that grand mean, not against zero. And likewise, our corrected total at the bottom is just our total sum of squares like we've seen before. It's corrected in the sense that we're um, comparing it against the grand mean and not against zero. So the language is a little bit different, but the calculations are pretty familiar from way back when we did um, one-way ANOVA and even before that when we did uh, multiple regression. And of course, what's new or kind of different about the way uh, output is set up in, in the GLM module is we get separate tests for our factors, for our predictor variables, for alcohol, gender, and the interaction of alcohol and gender. And in a separate supplemental video, I'll go into greater and maybe even excessive detail as to how these calculations are made. But suffice it to say that we get to test whether each one uh, is, um, whether an augmented model made up of each one is significantly better fitting the data than a compact model which doesn't include it. So these are nice tests that we often care about. All right, now I know I've thrown a lot of uh, new stuff at you in this lecture and it can be a little bit overwhelming. If you're feeling a bit sort of dizzy and confused with all the terms and the naming conventions, just relax. I promise you'll get the hang of this. Watch a few more of my videos. And of course, if you have questions, ask me. All right, preview for next time. We'll cover uh, more stuff about factorial ANOVA. We'll have some more practice with factorial ANOVA. But between now and then, just relax, make yourself a cup of tea, take it easy, and see if you can work through some of the examples that I've done in this lecture, because next time we'll be continuing. Okay, thanks so much. Bye-bye.